Good morning. It is good to see you this morning on this Valentine's Day, President's Day weekend. Uh, glad that uh, we're together in worship this morning. Uh, if we haven't had occasion to meet, my name is Tim Brewster, senior pastor here at uh, First Church. And on behalf of the whole church, I want to welcome you to this service of worship. And now let's prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of God. Good morning. Would you please stand and join me in our call to worship found in your bulletin. Friends, we gather together this morning to proclaim the ways in which God has been working in our midst. We have been blessed by God. We gather together to give thanks for the ways in which God is working in our midst. We are being blessed by God. We gather together to open our eyes to the ways God is using us to work in our midst. We will continue to be blessed by God. Dear ones, God has given us so much, and God calls us to be good stewards of all that we have received. We give thanks to God. We proclaim our faith in God. We worship God.
now as children of God, let's join together in our affirmation of faith, which you find in the bulletin. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. Our scripture lesson for today is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12. As he was teaching, he said, Watch out for the legal experts. They like to walk around in long robes. They want to be greeted with honor in the markets. They long for places of honor in the synagogues and at banquets. They are the ones who cheat widows out of their homes, and to show off they say long prayers. They will be judged most harshly. Jesus sat across from the collection box for the temple treasury and observed how the crowd gave their money. Many rich people were throwing in lots of money. One poor widow came forward and put in just two small copper coins worth about a penny. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I assure you that this poor widow has put in more than everyone who's been putting in money in the treasury. All of them are giving out of their spare change, but she, from her hopeless poverty, has given everything she had, even what she needed to live on. God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture. Thanks be to God. Well, even though it is President's Day tomorrow, and even though this is a great weekend for families to be away, away, I think I see some children here. And I want to invite you to come down here on the steps in front of Dr. B for our time together. Please do. Yeah, I think it is. Hey, everybody. And here comes the balcony shuttle. Oh, I love it when that happens. Coming artfully and safely. And it, gosh, it's so nice to see all of you today. Good morning. I'd like to introduce you to my helper, and his name is George. Can you say, good morning, George? Can you all say, good morning, George? Good morning, George. Wow, you're the focus of attention right now. Now, I have a question. George, what grade are you in school? First. Wow, first grade. You know what, George? I just heard a story this week about another first grader, a girl, and her name is Henrietta. 
Would you like to hear the story of Henrietta? Good, I'm so glad. Thank you for that enthusiastic yes. <laughs> because it was hypothetical, but thank you so much, George. So anyway, Henrietta, a first grader, went to her mommy and daddy and she said, I would love to have an allowance. You know, allowance is code language for, would you give me some money? <laughs> and her mommy and daddy thought about it and they said, yes, we will do that. But you know, we, you have so many good gifts, we need to have you think about what you could do in our house that uses your gifts. And thank you very much, Edward. And so, Henrietta thought about it, and then what she did, this is really neat. Henrietta got all dressed up, and she wrote down her notes, she made a resume, and she sat down at the kitchen table with her parents, and she said, here's why I think I could have an allowance. I think that I am a good manager. I could manage all the shoes in the house and make sure that all my little brothers have put their shoes where they're supposed to be. And I could also manage the bathroom. I could make sure that all the toys that we use when we're in the bathtub, those are put away and everything is neat. And so she really made a good impression on her parents and they said, you're hired. We would love you to be the manager for shoes and for the bathroom. And for that, we'll give you an allowance of $7 a week. And Henrietta was like, oh, she was already thinking about all the things she could do with $7 a week. And then her parents said another thing. They said, and here's something else. They said, we're going to give you uh, your money, not just in dollar bills, but also in, in coins, like in quarters and dimes and nickels and pennies. And we want to ask you every week to take 70 cents of your money and to share it with others, to take it to Academy and put it in the offering, to take it to church, or even to share it with people in other ways. And at first, I think Henrietta might have been a little disappointed. But once she started sharing her coins, she just became happier and happier and happier. And you know what? Just a moment ago, we all heard the story from the Bible today. And the story from the Bible, Mr. Eaton read it. And it was about a time when Jesus went to his church and he was watching people, and there was a woman who didn't have a lot of coins, but she brought two small coins, kind of like our pennies, and she gave those for other people. And in the story, Jesus said, she's the person who makes me happiest, and she is blessed by God. That means that that God's love and presence with her was really, really very important. You know, George, wasn't, wasn't there a basket of pennies someplace around here? Mm -hmm. Was there? Mm -hmm. If I hold this, could you go get it? Mm -hmm. Would you run like the wind? Run, go, go, go. Oh, it's so good having a mommy close by. You are very fast. I'm going to give that back to you. Everybody, George and I have, we have bags. And each bag has two pennies. And after our prayer, George and I want to give each one of you two bags. And what we want to ask you to do is keep one bag for yourself. And then with the second bag, we'd like to ask you to share it with someone with someone in your family, with a friend. You might decide to share it in Academy or any place that you like. Because it really is true that when we do that, we are happy 
And you know, Jesus is really happy also. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for being with us, for loving us, and for helping us realize that when we share the blessings that you give us, we can smile and our lives make such a difference for others. And we want to do that. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, George, are you ready to hand out the pennies? Okay, everybody, come, please come get two bags of pennies from George, okay? And you know what? As the bag distribution continues, I want to thank my helper, George, today, and I want to thank each one of our children for being here and for being willing to not only receive, but to share and to give. Thanks to all of you for being here today. We appreciate your presence so very much. I hope that you have let us know that you've been here today by filling out the attendance pad sharing that with others. There's something that you could do if you're interested. Thank you, George. You can take that back to your seat. Thanks, Reverend Nancy. We have Ash Wednesday coming up very soon. It's going to be a week from this coming Wednesday on April 26th. We have services at noon, 615 for children and families, and seven o'clock again. If you would be interested in helping out as a greeter or an usher for one of those services, if you would, next to your name on the attendance pad, if you would simply write Ash Wednesday or even AW or something like that, give us a way to contact you. And then Lisa Helm, our Director of Welcoming Ministries, will be excited to make a contact with you and help arrange that. And we thank you in advance for that. You know, the main thing I want to do this morning is talk about two reasons that next Sunday is really exciting and very distinctive. The first reason is that there is a new adult Sunday school class that's going to begin next Sunday. The class is called Open Door. It's going to meet at 9.30 up on the third floor. And the class is really designed for younger couples, younger adults, some for people who have been part of the church for a while, and, and also for others who are new to our church. This is a class that's beginning next week, and if you or someone you know has been looking for a group like this where you can share with one another, learn with one another, we want to invite you to come be a part of that. It begins next Sunday at 9.30. If you have any questions at all, please give me a call during the week or look on our website, um, and we would love for you to be a part of the Open Door class. We also would love for you to be a part of our combined worship services. They're going to be next Sunday here in the sanctuary, 9.30 and 11 o'clock. All of our worshiping communities are going to be coming together here. And this is because next Sunday is our Commitment Sunday, connected to the Next 90 program. So I invite you to look forward to choosing 9.30 or 11 to be here in the sanctuary. Actually, you can come to Wesley Hall as early as 9 o'clock, and there will be refreshments, and it's a time to be able to see one another and uh, enjoy being with one another. We have a vision room that's on the second floor of our building. If you would like to come early and just ask one of us to take you to the vision room, it gives you a chance to see the first 90 years of our church and then what the next 90 promises to be. You have information in your bulletin today to related to the commitment profile 
And I know that Dr. B is going to be talking about this uh, in his sermon this morning, but we really invite you and encourage you to be part of this celebration next Sunday here in the sanctuary, either at 9.30 or 11 o'clock. Well, we come to that time where we always offer the peace of Christ to one another. And if you've been around for a while, you know that, you know, this is time, the time of the year, every year, when, you know, there's illness, sometimes there's flu, sometimes, um, you know, it's just that time when we often say, let's be enthusiastic, let's offer the peace of Christ with passion, but let's not touch anyone. So with that in mind, I invite you now to stand, to move around, to say good morning to others, and to offer them the peace of Christ. Please be seated. Jesus could be harsh with some people, but he wasn't harsh with the people that were generally the victims of harshness from, well, the scholars of the law, the religious scholars of the law, the religious leaders, many of them, those who were religious, they were harsh with the tax collectors and the sinners. They're the ones that were the kind of religious outcasts of Jesus' day, but Jesus was never harsh with them. But when he was harsh, it was with many of those very religious leaders. 
the ones who, he said, were hypocritical, the ones who often did what they did for show. Um, Remember Jesus' words we heard a moment ago when he said, watch out for the legal experts. They like to walk around in long robes. That makes me a little uncomfortable. They want to be greeted with honor in the markets. They long for places of honor in the synagogues and at banquets. Then he says they're the ones who cheat widows out of their homes. And to show off, they say long prayers. They'll be judged most harshly. And so it's right after that that Jesus is sitting watching the temple treasury collection boxes there. People are coming to make their gifts, and many are doing it with great fanfare. You can imagine large coins that really make a nice sound when they fall into the collection box, or a lot of coins that really make an impressive show. And Jesus is concerned about the kind of hypocrisy of that. It reminds me of a story my grandmother told me when I was a kid. She said there was a man in in her church that only gave to the church about twice a year. He was very well-to-do, but he gave only twice a year, and he did it in this way. He would gather up money in a shoebox, and when he got a bunch of dollar bills in there, he would bring it to the church, and when the plate came around, he would ceremoniously pile the plate high. Everybody knew what he was doing. And it was the stuff of sidebar conversations. Well, Jesus is watching the temple treasury and he sees the same sort of thing happening. But then he notices a woman that no one else probably noticed. A very poor widow. Now, it's almost redundant to say poor widow. Because in that culture, in that time and place, the poorest of the poor, those who were on the lowest rung of the socioeconomic ladder were widows and orphans. See, a widow was not just a a woman who had lost her husband to death, but a woman who also had no other man, a, a son or anyone else that would care for her. And in that society, That meant she would live in poverty. And Jesus noticed her. And she came up to the collection box and she dropped in two small copper coins that equal about a penny. And when Jesus saw her gift, and he contrasted that with the other gifts that were being given, remember what he said? We heard his words a moment ago. He said, I assure you that this poor widow has put in more than everyone else who's been putting money in the treasury. All of them are giving out of their spare change. But she, from her hopeless poverty, has given everything she had, even what she needed to live on. Now, I have preached this story a lot of times in my ministry and and Friday afternoon now I want you to understand the timing of this Friday afternoon the sermon's written and Genia Garina Rodriguez gave me a, a new insight into this text that has changed my perspective on it Genia as I think most of you know is one of our associate pastors and she's a PhD in New Testament So I listen to Zhenya when she (laughs) shares with me. And she said, you know, if you look at the 40th verse and you look carefully at what Jesus actually says about that woman's gift, you'll have a different perspective. So I looked. It's that 40th verse where Jesus said of the legal experts, the scribes, these particular religious leaders, that they, um, they rob the widows of their houses. Hmm. And then Jesus is watching the people give their gifts, and the widow comes along, and what does he say about her gift? That she has given everything she has, even 
what she needs to live on. Hmm. And so the question is, is Jesus praising that gift or is he doing what he so often does? He's teaching his disciples something about the place of money in people's lives, but also about religious practices of his day. And especially of the temple. You know, Jesus is very critical of the temple. He cleanses the temple. He goes in and turns over the money changers in the temple. And, and it's because of sort of the corrupt processes around money that he had seen there. And, and there's this poor widow that gives everything away. So Jinya pointed out that uh, it's very likely that Jesus is, is saying something about the onerous burdens of the law that these religious authorities have placed on people so that this poor widow is bound to give everything, even what she needs to live on. That really challenged me to think about this uh, in a different way. And as I thought about, about this and, and, and how I want to talk about uh, proportionate giving today, it occurs to me that perhaps what we have here is an illustration from Jesus of two different, very different people neither one of whom is giving a gift that represents their ability to do so. Neither is giving a gift that rep represents them. On the one hand, you have the people who are very capable of major gifts who, as it says in our translation of the text that we heard a moment ago, who are giving out of spare change. It's not a gift that represents them. On the other hand, you have this poor widow who gives everything, even what she needs to live on. That's not a gift that represents her either. It's much more than that, maybe giving to her own harm. Well, it's something to think about, that way of looking at this story, but the point is that throughout Scripture we find a constant call to give gifts that represent us, that are proportionate for one thing. And so I want us to think together this morning about that question. What is a gift that represents you? What is a gift that represents you? Look over in the Hebrew Scriptures and you find the concept of tithing. And so a gift that represents you is a gift that's given in proportion to what you have received. It's a gift that's given in proportion to how you've been blessed. That's the concept of the tithe, proportionate giving, 10% of income. I believe in tithing. I think it's a really good, it's a really good proportion for us to uh, have as a, as a spiritual discipline. Susan and I have been doing that since early in our marriage. But proportionate giving is found not just in the Hebrew Scriptures, but in the New Testament as well. When Jesus says, from, uh, for, uh, to whom much has been given, from that person much will be expected. And we'll, talk, we'll see that again in Paul in a few minutes. So we give in proportion to what we've received. That's a gift that represents us, who we are, our ability to give. A gift that represents us, a gift that rep represents you, is a gift that you give voluntarily and with joy. I remember when I was a teenager at First United Methodist Church of Shreveport, Louisiana, and my pastor told a story to the congregation, without using a name, of course, of a member of that congregation who was living right on the edge. Uh, he, had, he had a job, but he could just barely make it and he was just right on the edge all the time sometimes he had to reach out for some help from the church or another agency but he always gave 10 percent of his income now my pastor being a pastor wanted to care for this person and so he said to him look you're giving you're giving 10 percent of your income but that's that's money you need i mean you you can make yourself more comfortable with that. And the reason I remember that story is the man's response. The man said, I don't have much as it is. Please don't take my joy of giving away from me too. That's amazing. It's, it's sort of that, 
joyful experience of being able to give. It's, it's, it's part of what makes us fully human, this ability to, to give. Uh, the Apostle Paul talks about this. We, we looked at it uh, in an earlier sermon in the, in the series, giving from the heart. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 9, everyone should give whatever they've decided in their heart. They shouldn't give with hesitation or because of pressure. God loves a cheerful giver. God has the power to provide you with more than enough of every kind of grace. That way, you will have everything you need always and in everything to provide more than enough for every kind of good work. God loves a cheerful giver. So a gift that represents you is a gift that you give voluntarily and with joy. And so as you think about your participation in Next 90, think about a gift that represents you in that way. A gift that represents you is a gift that is generous, maybe even sacrificial. Generosity is also at the heart of Jesus' teachings, and it's at the heart of Scripture throughout, how we are called to give of ourselves, our time, our talents, and our treasure. A gift that represents you is a gift that is generous. A gift that may even be sacrificial in some way. Paul, when he was raising funds for the famine to help those who were victims of the famine in and around Jerusalem, Paul writes uh, both in the 8th and 9th chapter of 2 Corinthians about that, but in the 8th chapter he begins by praising the Christians in Macedonia. And he holds them up really as an example of of givers, of gifts that really represent who they are. And it's in this brief passage that Paul really covers all this, proportionate giving and and, uh, joyful, voluntary uh, giving and generous, even perhaps sacrificial giving. Listen to his words. Brothers and sisters, we want to let you know about the grace of God that was given to the churches of Macedonia. While they were being tested by many problems, their extra amount of happiness and their extreme poverty resulted in a surplus of rich generosity. I assure you that they gave what they could afford, and even more than they could afford, and they did it voluntarily. They urgently begged us, for the privilege of sharing in this service for the saints. A gift is appreciated because of what a person can afford, not because of what the person can't afford, if it's apparent that it's done willingly. And so you can hear in Paul's words, it sort of echoes back to those two extremes of giving that we see in the story that, of the widow's might. That somewhere in there, there is a gift that represents who we are. Our ability to give. Represents what gives us joy. And allows us to participate more fully in what God is doing in the world. A gift that we give that's generous. Perhaps even sacrificial. Now I want you to know that uh, I am not asking you to do anything that I'm not doing. I wouldn't do that. Susan and I have been on this same journey that I've asked you to be on, to think about your commitment to the Next 90 campaign. And we've talked about it. We've looked at, at, at options. We've prayed about it. Uh, we've decided to give up some things and to uh, change some things so that we can give a gift that represents us. And, and we've done that. And we've, we've made our commitment. And, and when we made that commitment, we, we made it knowing that, yes, that, that is the gift that's appropriate for us. And I'm inviting you to do the same thing. I'm inviting you to also make those decisions. Now, we've had... 87 people as of before the first service this morning who have already made their commitment, the advance commitment. 
And the total of their commitment uh, is uh, uh, three and a half million dollars, almost exactly, just a smidgen under that. Uh, some more commitments came in since then, but uh, I don't have a report on, on those yet. And Commitment Sunday is not until next week. But along with those commitments and some bequests that we had and funds uh, that came from our foundation that our trustees set aside for this project, uh, we are at right at eight and a half million dollars today. Our commitment Sundays next week, all six of our worshiping communities will be together at 9, 30 and 11 here in, in the sanctuary. And it's next Sunday that we're asking everyone to participate by turning in your commitment card. Now I invite you to look in your bulletin and see there a, a sheet that says at the top, Commitment Profile. And $15 million is our goal for the first phase of our next 90 program. It's a two-year commitment. That is, we're asking that people pay out their commitment uh, over a two-year period. And this sheet was prepared by our consultants, our stewardship consultants, capital campaign consultants, who tell us that this is what it takes to get to our goal, this level of gifts, these number of gifts. Now, uh, not everybody can make a six or seven figure gift. Yes, I know. <laughs> That's what it would, that would be my response if asked for a six or seven uh, digit gift. But everybody, and I want you to hear this, everybody is represented on that page. Everybody. See, it takes all of us together, gifts of every size, gifts that represent who we are to make this happen. And so I urge you to take, take some time, think about it, pray about it. Ask yourself, what is a gift that represents me? It really represents me. A gift that I give in proportion to how I've been blessed. A gift that, uh, that I give voluntarily and with joy. A gift that's generous, perhaps even somewhat sacrificial. I remember years ago, I... Uh, a pastor gave me that, that phrase, a gift that represents you. I, I'd never heard that before. And it was a phrase that popped into his mind when he had a conversation with a church member who came to give him a check for a capital campaign they were doing. She handed in the check and she asked the question, is this enough? And he said, I, I don't know where it came from, but, but my response was, it is if it represents you. And he said she took the check back, looked very thoughtful, and then walked away. And, and you can imagine he said, oh no, <laughs> that was not a good move. But a couple of days later, she came back. And he said the check that she handed him was... Ten times the amount of that first check. And when she handed it to him, she said, you know, I've thought a lot about what you ask, and, and I've prayed about that, and I've wrestled with that, and this is the gift that represents me. And I'm happy to give it, she said. That's what I invite you to do. Between now and next, next Sunday, to think about it, pray about it, and decide what is a gift that represents you. Amen.
O loving and gracious God, indeed, you have made each one of us a sanctuary, a sacred being, because you have made each and every one of us your child. And you say to us, you are enough. You are loved. You are my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. And once we know that we please God, then think of the joy that we have to do our very best to please others, to serve others, to give according to our abilities, to share in ways that represent each of us. We are so grateful, O oh God, for this church in every place of worship so that we can be part of a community to make a difference, to make a loving difference, to create more and more sanctuaries. And we do so in Jesus' name, in whose name we now pray as we join together saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I invite our ushers to come forward, and as they do, the most appropriate message is simply gratitude. Thank you to each one of you for your presence, for all the ways that you give your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness, because together it is always enough.
You know, the first thing I want to ask you to do is to join me in thanking the Cornerstone Youth Choir for their leadership and their voices. And now I say to you what we say at the end of every sanctuary service, and that is that our intention is to give you all a number of different ways to respond at the end of the service after Dr. Brewster's benediction. We have a team of first friends. I'm convinced that they were actually siblings who uh, were separated at birth and now they've found each other. Uh, Glenda Maynard and, and Randy Brooks and Michael Dixon. Um, after Dr. Brewster's benediction, they'll be coming together down here to this part of the communion rail. Uh, they have a, bis bas a biscuit. They do not have biscuits, but they do have. <coughs> They have a basket of gifts that they offer to those of you who are new to our church, to our guests, to new residents. And so if you are in that category, I invite you to come uh, visit with them after the service. They would love to meet you and thank you for being here. If you are interested in talking with me about how membership works in our church, if you've been coming for a while, I would love to do that after the service and I'll be down here at this side of the communion rail. And also, if any of you wanna come after the service for a word of prayer about anything at all, I also would be honored to do that. So with all those ways in mind, let us now raise our voices to God. Well, friends, we are honored to introduce to you Robert Ward. Robert goes by Bob. Uh, he is becoming part of our church family today as an associate member, which means that he has relationships uh, with more than one United Methodist Church, and we are honored to welcome you today, Bob. Indeed we are, Bob. And I ask you, as you become part of this congregation, uh, do you reaffirm your faith in Christ? Yes. And will you be loyal to the church and uphold it by your prayers, presence, yes. gifts, service, and witness? Yes. <laughs> All right. Welcome. Welcome to you. 
And uh, Bob will be down here for you to uh, greet him following the service. I also want to share with you that between the services, we had a, a, a service in the chapel uh, where um, about a dozen, maybe 15, uh, people joined the church uh, in, in, uh, in that special service uh, too. And I know you'll want to watch your uh, e-news uh, to, to see their faces, put a name and a face together and have a chance to greet and welcome them. Also, at the back of the sanctuary are brochures about the Next 90 program. If you, for some reason, haven't gotten one of those yet, they're back there and uh, right, yes, right there. And uh, uh, also, uh, there should be in the pews uh, commitment cards. You should also get one in the, in the mail as well uh, so that you can be prepared for next Sunday for our commitment Sunday. Our gathering will soon be ended. Where will we go and what will we do? May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. Amen.